Good afternoon, and welcome to our virtual Alumni Day programming. I'm Karen McQuake, Alumni Director at MAC, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And a very special greeting to those who are celebrating their anniversaries this year, the classes of 1945, 50, 55, 60, 65, and 70. Congratulations on your milestone, and we look forward to having you back on campus next June. I am now very pleased to introduce Dr. Praminda Reyna for the Wisdom of Aging. Dr. Reyna is the lead principal investigator of the groundbreaking research study, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. In addition to his role with the CLSA, Praminder is a professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact, and scientific director of the McMaster Institute for Research on Aging. Dr. Reyna holds a tier one Canada research chair in Gerio Science and the Raymond and Margaret Labarge chair in Optimal Aging. Before I turn it over to Perminder, one point about that if you would like to submit a question during the presentation, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A icon and that's where you can submit your questions. Dr. Reyna, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Karen. And thanks everyone for uh, joining us through Zoom. These are unprecedented times and I really appreciate you taking some time uh, on a Saturday, beautiful Saturday afternoon to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about something I have not spoken about before. That is that Karen and her team actually came up with the title of Wisdom of Aging. So I've been pondering about it, what I was going to talk today, which links what I know, which is healthy aging and health-related research and wisdom. So I sort of modified the title for this afternoon's talk to talk about what is the connection between wisdom and healthy aging. In addition to that, I also wanted to thank our funders, obviously for Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, uh, Government of Canada, many of the provinces and the university itself have contributed substantial resources to make this happen. But more importantly, to uh, Suzanne Labarge, who has uh, provided major resources to the university to move forward the agenda for research on aging. Without her contribution and contributions like that, we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do the innovative research that happens at McMaster University. So, okay, how do I move this forward? Yes. So my presentation is sort of categorized in four sections. First of all, why there is interest in aging and aging population now. And I'll, I'll spend a couple of minutes about this and then I'm going to explore what does it mean, what is wisdom, and how do we quantify wisdom, and what does it mean in the context of the research. And then I'm going to move into what I know the best is about healthy aging, and I will try to make some links with wisdom and healthy aging and the whole aging process. And at the end, I would like to make some reflections because of the unprecedented time periods we are in, pandemic, uh, some of the protests that are going across the world, especially in US, and what does that mean for all of us as we uh, move through these difficult times and think about wisdom and healthy aging. So let me first talk about demography and aging. Um, some of, most of you who are here are probably quite aware. Uh, population aging is important. It's an amazing achievement of modern public health system, our social systems, and is unquestionably the most important demographic force of the first half of the 21st century. And the second half is going to be the climate change and what collisions the demographic force and the changes in climate happen uh, is an interesting topic, perhaps a talk for another day. Aging itself, is nothing new. Uh, in 1897, Carl Pearson depicted, and many other artists in that time period also depicted, depicted the cycle of life, birth to death, and how we age, and what all sorts of things we face as we go through different life stages. And even at that point in time, if you look at the picture and read about this picture, there is a certain hint and notion that as we get older, we gather wisdom all along our journey. And that's why the oldest person on the right side of this picture looks like somebody wise and sage. 
However, that the concept of aging itself is not new. What is new in the current environment where policymakers, governments, researchers, and everybody in the society is uh, dealing with is the whole notion of longevity. That is new. Longevity has started to happen in the last 30 to 40 years that we are living uh, very long. This is a magazine cover from Time magazine where the speculation was the baby born today could live up to 142. I don't believe we will live to 142, but the point is that, that we are living a lot longer than we used to live, uh, uh, let's say 50, 60, or even 100 years ago. And this phenomenon is not that different in Canada as well. This is a um, moving picture that starts with a pyramid that there's more young people at the bottom and fewer people at the top. And as we move through the time and go project up to 2050, and we see this is an upside down pyramid, there's more people, older people at the top and fewer uh, young people at the bottom. So the dynamic of the population has shifted and continues to shift and it will shift even more. And this was reported in a Statistics Canada report in 2050 that Canada has started to show its age as seniors, people over the age of 65, outnumber children for the first time. So this raises whole sorts of issues uh, for the governments, for the policymakers, for the society. Uh, it's an opportunity uh, in many ways, but it also poses certain challenges. And some of the challenges we have seen in relation to the long-term care and the pandemic and what kind of devastation this pandemic has caused on aging population and impact on the policymakers through that. As we age, there's a general understanding that as we age, we become wiser. The question is, are we really wise as we age? Do we gather that wisdom? And that raises the question, what is wisdom? A recent paper in Journal of Gerontology, which is a, a important journal in, journal in the field of aging, uh, sort of talked about this whole notion of uh, wisdom, and it began with the following sentence. It is often assumed, colloquially, that wisdom comes with age and experience, yet empirically and anecdotally, this is not necessarily the case. And the paper continues, wisdom seems to be rare among any age group, leave alone older people. Rare, the word rare has an important as is, as in not common. For that matter, what is wisdom? Everyone seems to know what is on some level, but is difficult to articulate. Even Socrates did not quite nail it. The only true wisdom, he said, is in knowing you know nothing. As I was trying to learn about this whole scientific view of wisdom, Socrates really didn't help me in sorting this out. So I went on to looking at other wise people around the globe. And I came across this uh, particular painting where Buddha, from an Eastern philosophy point of view, says wisdom only comes to those who can control their minds and achieve enlightenment. And here enlightenment is with the, with the capital E. Here at least, there is a hint as to what wisdom actually might be. Good health, bringing happiness to your family, and peace to all. If we go to other religious scriptures in the Bible, God grants Solomon wisdom. But Solomon then does something utterly foolish and turns away from God, which doesn't work out so well for him. So the point of this is that perhaps wisdom is a fleeting thing, or at least something that needs to be nurtured like a garden. So if I continue on this thought before I start to talk about healthy aging, let me, think of, let me take you through a bit of a example where practical application of wisdom and knowledge, at least in the scientific literature, is quantified. Science has approached the question of wisdom in different ways. In the field of information science, we're associated with collecting and storing information. 
Wisdom resides at the top of a pyramid. Base of the pyramid is data. Look at your bank account statement. The entries, the credits and debits to your account, those are data. By themselves, they are meaningless. Put into context, however, the data becomes information by itself. Without context, data is useless. Information is useless. For example, $212 that you might have spent at the supermarket on gro groceries, that is a information. Now the question comes, what do you do with this information? That becomes knowledge. Knowledge is information that, has, that gets internalized by a person. Knowledge is knowing that $212 that you might have spent on groceries will provide you energy and nutrition for you or your family members for a week. But only if you make a big pot of chili with red beans and eat oatmeal for breakfast every day except for Sunday, and some people like to eat pancakes on Sundays. Your knowledge includes knowing this is totally doable since you, you love oatmeal and you can extend the chili by boiling some pasta for chili mac later in the week, which also many of us might love. Wisdom is the use of the knowledge for good and for good health, for financial well-being and the good opportunity for humanity and our social relationships. And this is where wisdom starts to connect. What do we do in our day-to-day -day life and how do we live and how that translates into uh, healthy aging that becomes important. So knowledge comes from learning and wisdom comes from living. At least that's what I was able to glean from some of the literature that talks about wisdom. And then I wanted to, as a quantitative researcher, I wanted to see what is actually the definition that I could actually use if I was to go and measure and try to understand the processes of aging related to that. So I went to the most trusted source, which is the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And it has three definitions, insight, which is basically an understanding of people and their relationships, and presumably being able to navigate relationships. So here it talks about how we live in our social networks and our social milieu that actually determines how wise or not we are. Knowledge, simply once accumulated information that we learn through experiences that allows us to navigate the journey of life. And then finally, the judgment, which is nothing more or less than having good sense. So if I take this notion of wisdom and think about what research has thought about healthy aging, it actually comes into something like this. Obviously, we have our biology and genetics that we inherit from our families and our uh, uh, parents and grandparents. But beyond that, much of it is what we do with ourselves. Uh, it is good quality of life, how we behave, what kind of social networks and social associations we develop, how we keep our mind and body sharp, and how do we stay healthy as long as possible. So this is what the concept of healthy aging that we have applied to the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging that Karen mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. So what we wanted to do and understand that why some people age in healthy fashion and others don't. And that requires a complex type of a research plan that not only looks at biology of aging, but sociology of aging or psychology of aging. It looks at environment, economics, and everything. And how all of that can comes together and defines and understand why some people age in a healthy fashion and others do not. What is CLSA? Let me give you a bit of a context and then I will sort of hit on some of the uh, prime findings that we have observed over the last few years. CLSA is a research platform that is composed of 50,000 participants at the baseline when we started we recruited people between the ages of 45 and 85 living in the community. And this is a Canada-wide study 
and, uh, and we collect data from these individuals through telephone interviews. We ask go to their homes. We bring them to our data collection sites and collect all sorts of data, which I will tell you what we collect. And, and then each one of these individuals are followed every three years, and they will, we will continue to follow them for the next 20 years and hopefully more. And this is one of the largest study on aging, not only in Canada, but globally. And, and it provides very relevant data from a point of view of science, advancing the science of aging, but also from the perspective of policy. Example of that is that as part of the pandemic COVID-19, we were actually quickly able to launch a COVID-19 study as part of the CLSA to understand how pandemic is going to impact the social and mental health of many of the people who are part of this study and probably reflects uh, what the rest of the country, especially in this age group, is experiencing. And this sort of gives you a map where the data collection happens across the country. You see, we don't have much in the north, northern part of Canada, and this is for logistical reasons. And, and, uh, and so we follow the Statistics Canada, the way they select individuals, and that's what we did here as well. This gives you a, some sense of breadth and depth of CLSA. We I give you an examples here. You don't have to memorize any of this. I won't be doing any testing at the end, but it tells you we collect data on sociodemographic information, ethnicity, culture, language, um, sexual orientation, income wealth. And we also collect information on lifestyle and behavior, such as smoking, cannabis use, alcohol use, nutritional risk, physical activities, nut nut nutritional intake, and so on and so forth. In addition to that, we collect information which is more related to general health. And that might include general health, women's health issues, vision, hearing, oral health, how people function in their day-to-day -day life, injuries, falls, and so on and so forth. In addition to many of the diseases that inflict as we age, and we are trying to capture those as well. In addition to that, as I mentioned, when I was started to talk about the CLSA, we also capture some of the other important determinants of healthy aging. That is our psychological well-being, our psychological health, whether it be positive mental health or a negative mental health, such as depression, our cognition, our interaction with our social networks, whether we are socially engaged or lonely. Uh, what happens to us in early in life, how that impacts to us in later, in, later in, the, in life. Labor force issues, retirement, pre-retirement, and changes that happen in the workplace. Social health, we are, humans are social beings, so we need social networks, but how we engage with our social networks becomes very important. What kind of sport availability we have, care receiving and caregiving social inequalities, how do we interact in the modern day environments such as online, transportation, mobility, migration, built environments, where we live, how that environment impacts us as we age. Also collect data on diet, uh, medication, sleep, distress, personality traits, obviously height, weight, and other things that are important from health point of view. We also go on to collect blood samples for all over, not all 50,000, but 30,000 of the 50,000. And we do more detailed uh, cognitive assessments on the 30,000 of the 50,000 people and do some very deep uh, measurements related to their hip waist circumference, blood pressure, body composition, how people perform, such as time up and go, standing balance, four meter walk, their strength, their vision, images of their vision, hearing, lung function. We try to understand what is happening with the vascular system of people by taking the images of people's carotid artery. ECG, we also look at the deposits of calcium in aorta and other uh, 
uh, arteries in the body that have serious implications for heart disease, stroke, or uh, cognitive impairment as we age, the bone health, and, and try to understand how the fat gets distributed in the body and how that impacts health and well being and healthy aging trajectories. So you can see it is extremely comprehensive study with a wealth of data that we continue to collect. And, and, and make it available uh, to researchers, not only in Canada, but globally, to answer some of the most important questions that are relevant to older people now and the generations coming behind who are going to age uh, in a different environment, but some of the things are going to be exactly the same. We also capture issues related to environment, and we work with a group, group another research group funded by the government of Canada where we try to link our data, either at a postal code level or a census subdivision level, with data related to social and material deprivation indices, uh, mobility, how the walk walkability issues, weather and climate, air quality, nighttime light. For example, cities these days are always lit up, how that artificial light impacts our sleeping behaviors and how the sleeping behaviors might have issues with depression and mental health and other health related issues. And greenness, if we live close to the green environments, does that do good for our health or what kind of advantages and disadvantages that come with it? We also, as I said earlier on, collect blood samples and detailed uh, biological issues. We are uh, looking at what happens in the blood, what happens to our chemistry in our body. We are looking at genetics, what kind of genetic predispositions we might have that might determine what type of a, tra a trajectory we might uh, end up with when it comes to health. Um, epigenetics, which is that you could have a normal genetic profile, but from an environmental debris point of view, that switch doesn't get turned on and off. And we want to understand how this environmental influence on genetics might actually impact what happens to one, one's health and well-being. Other exciting area that is emerging is that now with the technology and the availability of the, with the novel approaches, we can actually look at thousands of metabolites that occur in the, in the body that have implications for all sorts of different diseases. And we can also try to capture those and try to create a complete picture how much of the healthy aging is biological or how much of it is social and psychological. And it might be that some aspects are more related to biology, but other aspects are related to social or psychological things. If we understand that, then we can design interventions to help people age in a healthy fashion in the future. But this is kind of interesting and relevant to what is happening in the world right now. This is a bit technical, but I wanted to sort of quickly explain. This is on the x-axis. We have age, which goes from 40 to 70. And on the y-axis, we have a percent of Y chromosome. This is a uh, genetic information. And what it shows that as you age, there is a loss in this Y chromosome that means certain types of somatic mutations are happening naturally in the body. So the question which nobody understands as yet, as these mutations happen, these changes happen with our genetic profile, such as Y chromosome, does that actually predispose us more to developing a disease or having a poor health? And recently, there's also been a suggestion that the older people who are getting severe COVID-19 uh, disease, is that due to some underlying biology and that biology might be related to these types of mutations or other underlying health uh, chronic conditions that the people might have. So in order to study something like that, you need large numbers because these are not common occurrences. So you want to gather information for many, many thousands of people to be able to sort out a uh, signal from the noise. So this gives you a bit of a context what the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging is. 
And what I thought that I will give you some snippets of data. Uh, there's so much coming out of uh, CLSA. There are over 300 or 400 researchers now, not only in Canada, but globally using these data to answer some really fascinating questions. But in the context of what we are doing right now, what, how we are living under pandemic, and we are hearing daily news about how it impacts that uh, coronavirus impacts people differently, that it has a very different impact on people living in uh, social inequality or health inequality. And we are seeing uh, some of that impact in our aging population, especially living in long-term care sector. So I wanted to touch base the how CLSA could handle and inform policymakers and research in relation to health and social inequalities among Canadians. And what could we do if we knew uh, if we have these data and what should be done in the future. These are some early findings and, and, uh, and I'm going to highlight some of these things. Before I get into that, I wanted to give you a bit of a context, who is in the CLS. Majority of the participants are self-identified as European origin. Majority of them born in Canada and most often speak English at home or French if they are from Quebec. Majority of the CLSA participants are married or live in common law relationship. And in the oldest age group, which is 75 to 85, almost 74% of men, but only 36% of women are married. And the majority of those who are widowed are women. And this sort of brings in the notion, which I'll talk later, social isolation and loneliness and how we live our lives or forced to live our lives in later years. Education-wise, 74% in the CLSA report having a post-secondary uh, degree or diploma, 7.5% report having some post-secondary education, around 11% report graduating from secondary school, and around 7% report that did not graduate from high school. And the percent of the people who didn't graduate from high school is a little lower in the CLSA in comparison to the Canadian census data. So we might be underrepresenting uh, some of these people in our study. Similarly, in, by income, we have, we have numbers, but the population representation of people in low income group is slightly on the low side in the CLSA as compared to what we see in Canada. 30, 33% reported their total household income to be 50 to 100,000 range, and 5.7%, which is not small, indicate their annual total household income is less than 20,000. That's a substantial number of people who are living below the poverty line. Women aged 75 to 85 are the group with the highest proportion with a total household income of less than 12, 20,000. So already, you see that the, even the descriptive data start to show you that, the, that the, there is a gender inequality that happens in our society, but on top of that, that the, the, the income disparity also creates challenges uh, for these individuals as they move through the life stages and age. Retirement is another important uh, uh, trigger point in, in as we age, uh, and 45% of the CLSA participants indicate they are completely retired, and around 11% report they are partly retired. At age 75 to 85, majority of the people are reporting uh, uh, they are retired. However, what I don't have here on the slide, around 20 to 22% of the people, once they retire, they go back to work, mostly for financial reasons, and that number tends to be higher in women. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the projects that uh, one of some of our colleagues from uh, Quebec and other parts of the country did. And again, as I mentioned, that the CLSA collects very rich data on vision and hearing and cognition. And, and there has been a speculation over the last few years uh, that, that these sensory inputs might be linked to cognition and eventually with dementia. So having a large study like CLSA, actually these researchers looked at that relationship 
and data from CLSS suggests a link between declines in sensory acuity, that is hearing and vision loss, and cognition. And what they exactly found was boring, poor hearing was linked to declines in memory and executive function in otherwise healthy autonomous community dwelling older adults. And this gives us a bit of a clue if this research pans out and is replicated by other researchers, that we can actually think about interventions that focus on hearing or creating support structure that actually allow people to function in their own homes and their communities a lot longer if we, understanding, if we understand what the origins of their cognitive uh, deficits might be. Same research has also found that social factors such as social participation, social networks, loneliness, and social support do not explain the link between cognition and sensory loss because there is a debate that this must be an artificial relationship because it might be explained by these other things that are very important from a cogn cognition point of view. But again, having a rich data like CLSA is able to so sort these relationships out and start to give credence to this particular hypothesis that there is a link between sensory factors and cognition because sens sensory factors such as hearing and vision are highly uh, controlled by the brain as well. Another area which is of very importance and it has come to the forefront completely under this pandemic, the issue of social isolation and loneliness. Prevalence of social isolation and loneliness was five, almost 5% and 10% respectively. And this is important to keep in mind that somebody who's socially isolated doesn't mean that they are lonely. These are two different uh, concepts that we need to think about them in a different way. But they vary substantially who is socially isolated and who is lonely. And, and these are some of those characteristics. So the older adults in the CLSA tend to have indicate they are not only socially isolated, as we have seen in the news clips lately related to uh, the pandemic and that, that the people who have never been, have not been able to leave their homes or people in the long-term care who have lost total connection with their family members are not only socially isolated, but also feeling lo lonely. Sex is an important characteristic that defines the whole notion of social isolation, women, education, low income, people tend to have more features of isolation and loneliness, low income, functional impairment as people start to become functionally dependent and chronic diseases. Association between some geographic factors emerge for social isolation, but not loneliness. For loneliness, the focus may be less on where people live, but rather on personal characteristics that put people at risk of getting lonely, such as low income, having functional impairment, or living in, in, in an area where there is not an environment uh, that uh, allows them to move around easily in, in their community, such as lack of transportation. Other area that CLSA researchers have been focusing on is related to, for example, nutrition and depression. Again, if I take you back to my earlier comments about wisdom and how that links to uh, healthy aging, all of these things that we do in our life impacts our healthy aging trajectory. And it is one thing to have an information it is how we process that information and create into knowledge and implement into our day-to-day -day life becomes important. And nutrition and healthy diet is one of those things. And, and what data shows that fewer intakes of fruits and vegetables were found to be linked to depression for both men and women and immigrants and those born in Canada. So it didn't really differentiate between people who are immigrants or who are new to Canada versus who have been in Canada for a long time. And also consistent with other previous research, results support that among middle-aged and older adults, those who are women working age, married, have lower education, have lesser annual income, are more, more likely to experience depression. Again, uh, some of the social determinants of health and healthy aging come into play. 
And, and this is important to keep in mind, which I'll talk later on. As I said, that the gender and lower income sort of goes hand in hand. So when social inequalities happen, there is usually a double and triple whammy that has a big impact on the healthy aging trajectories. And this is an example of that. If you're a woman, you have, a, uh, you are, have lower education, have less annual, annual income, you are going to experience some of the worst health outcomes such as depression as you age. But this is in another fascinating area that uh, we have been looking at in the context of the CLSA. This was not originally part of the CLSA, uh, but we added it at our first follow-up, which was in 2018, uh, that we wanted to understand what happens to the participants of the CLSA before the age of 18, what kind of adverse childhood experiences they experience and how that is going to impact uh, their later life. And on all 50,000, around 44,000 or so people, we looked at physical, sexual, emotional abuse, neglect, intimate partner violence, parental death, divorce and separation, and also living with a family member with a mental health problems. And this work is, uh, has been submitted for publication, is under review, and likely will be uh, accepted very soon. And what surprised me was that the six out of 10 participants reported exposure to at least one adverse childhood experience. Here it shows you 26% of the people reported physical abuse, 23%, 22 22% of indicated intimate partner violence, and around 22% uh, reported having experienced emotional abuse. So who is more likely to report these types of abuses? People who are younger than 65, because there might be a cohort effect, um, how people perceive abuse that might be affecting some of these responses. Women reported a lot more uh, abuses, uh, what they had experienced before the age of 18, in low-income groups, low education, and non-heterosexual individuals. Um, we have been doing more work in this space and trying to understand how does it manifest itself in health and healthy aging trajectory? Does it actually modify the underlying biology of the person because these are the things they have experienced and then that itself manifests into poor health outcomes uh, later in the life and that work is going to be coming out in the next year, year or so. As I mentioned before, that when we think about healthy aging, we can't think about one factor at a time. I showed you the example earlier on in relation to depression. It generally tends, bad things tend to cluster together. And that is also true uh, for our behaviors. And in the health research, each one of these risk factors, nutrition, poor nutrition, poor physical activity, smoking behavior, drinking alcohol, has been studied to death. But what is lacking in the aging literature is that do these things actually cluster together? If somebody has a poor diet, they also have poor physical uh, activity behavior, and they also smoke. And what impact all of those things might have on people's ability to age in a healthy fashion? So we took on this project and we wanted to see how these things cluster. Do they cluster, first of all? And what we found, the study suggests that low physical activity is the driver of the population burden of disability. Physical activity accounted for between 70 to 90 percent of the total population level risk in individuals with all these risk factors. So from a public health point of view, from an intervention point of view, if you want to start thinking about intervention, you not only want to focus on nutrition and smoking things, but actually the one that is going to give the biggest bang for your buck is going to be the physical activity. All three factors were independently associated with increased odds, odds of dis disability. And when we think about aging population, what we want to do is to come up with strategies 
that allows people to function in their homes and their communities as long as possible, because that's where they want to be. They want to be able to interact with their families, uh, their grandchildren, and their friends and neighbors. And we really need to think through that the only options that are offered right now are not viable from a long-term point of view. And pandemic actually has highlighted that long-term care places just sending our older people into those institutions is not the simplest option. We can do a lot more through home care, through research and community support to keep people independently as long as possible and reserve facilities like institutionalized settings for people who cannot be cared for in the community or in their homes. And this is another uh, interesting area that is emerging and Many of you have heard mostly in the younger people that how e-cigarettes were linked to many of the lung health problems in young people. And we wanted to understand people's behaviors are changing, people are smoking less and less. And we wanted to say, see what is the relationship in older aging population in relation to e-cigarettes and lung function. And I was surprised that there were that many individuals who were actually using e-cigarettes in our study. It's almost 5% or so uh, had ever used e-cigarette. 70% of those individuals reported uh, smoking e-cigarette that contained nicotine. And I, and I think, I suspect many of these individuals, we don't have data on this and we are going to be collecting, that this might have been used for quitting the tobacco smoking, the, the traditional way of smoking, and they were using e-cigarettes to kick their habit, habit. Males were more likely to have tried e-cigarettes than females. And the interesting thing was the individuals who reported ever using an e-cigarette had higher odds of having poor lung function. And this might be function because many of these people also smoked previously the, the regular cigarettes. And, and uh, but we see this association, this is early data, a lot more work needs to be done, independent of cigarette smoking, having uh, COPD, asthma, or other characteristics. Where are we going in relation to our research? And now we have started to get into understanding more in-depth underlying mechanisms uh, from having all sorts of this data as the more longitudinal data over time starts to become available, we can look at the uh, aging biology, we can look at environment and behavioral and other socialist factors and see how these things actually work together to manifest clinical issues and also psychosocial issues in our population. And there are several groups who are using CLSA data to start looking at these complex relationships that manifest themselves into a uh, age-related deficits or healthy aging or not healthy aging uh, trajectory. And it's also important to keep in mind as we think about wisdom and healthy aging, aging population is very heterogeneous. There is no typical older person. We see all sorts of people and they take different trajectories. So if we are going to really understand how people age and what different groups of groupings look like from a healthy aging trajectory, again, you need large data sets and multitudes of different types of studies that need to look at those heterogeneities that are, uh, that are present as people age. And heterogeneities actually increase substantially as people age. And at McMaster, in addition to CLSA, I wanted to highlight uh, with the support of many of you who are on the line and who have supported the McMaster Institute for Research and Aging, we are doing research in the area of transportation, uh, elderly driver, and so on and so forth, and how technology comes into play, physical activity, nutrition, diet, smart homes, and, and role of social interactions and, and other types of uh, studies like that. So there's much more than CLSA that is happening at McMaster that is really bringing McMaster to the forefront of aging research, not only in Canada, but also uh, globally. I wanted to come back to where I started this presentation that is connecting wisdom and healthy aging. 
I think wisdom is like a, a, a flower and, and it sort of blooms itself into the trajectories of health we take. And it involves not only the individual wisdom, but the wisdom of our communities, our societies. We have to think about dignity. We have to think about autonomy, security, how we build our environments, fairness, information, participation, and providing care to people who need it at the right place at the right time. How do we promote health and preventing disease and injury? Social interactions, engaging with life, optimizing our mental and cognitive function. And how do we major, manage chronic condition? And you can see these are behaviors, these are generally traditionally being uh, brought into from on a health sciences or social sciences lens point of view, but it also incorporates how we operationalize this information, how we incorporate that information into knowledge and how we design our lives daily. It actually interacts quite well with what research has labeled wisdom as. And I think uh, in closing, what I want to talk about the future of age it will be us. We are all going to age. Nobody is going to escape this. So what is our vision of our age at world? And that's going to be important. It's all up to us. It's not about me as an individual. It's about our society. And that is even becoming more paramount these days with what we are observing south of the border, all the protests, all the social injustice, and what has happened to aging population in relation to pandemic. These are not individual issues, these are collective issues. And how we manage those will determine what kind of society we are going to live, and as a society, what kind of wisdom uh, we will have that nurtures a healthy aging in our communities. I, I like this quote and I will end my presentation with this quote, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who wash them without doing anything. And I think we are seeing reflections of those in our society. We are seeing more and more that there's no bystanders. People are coming out and crying for social injustice and, and we have to do the same for ageism and what we, how we treat our older people in our communities. Thank you very much. And uh, I will stop here and take uh, questions from all of you. Thank you. So there is a question um, uh, from one of the uh, participants, the term aging brings negativity for the population. For example, long-term care situation, how do you change the culture to positive attitudes? Um, I will take a bit of an issue with that uh, question. And that is by negating the word aging itself, we are not accepting that aging is part of natural process. And I think aging is not a negative term. It is a very positive term. Question is, what do we do with it? And if you look at other cultures, in fact, what would be great if we could get away with it is to not have the term elderly or the aged in our vocabulary. If you go to some of these communities in Italy, Sardinia, which has one of the blue zones, people actually don't know the word aged or elderly. They are part of living. People age. As soon as you're born, you age. So I think if we are going to get rid of uh, uh, ageism, I think that's what the motion behind this question is. First of all, we have to accept that we are all going to age. Aging is part of living. And then we can say, how do we treat each other fairly, whether they be young or old, uh, is going to be the way we will create positive attitudes. There's another question uh, which is asking, do you consider aging a disease? Not at all. I think aging is not a disease. There are lots of people who do not have uh, health issues uh, and go on to live very healthy aging trajectories. And there are people who have health issues also go on to live very healthy lives because they have very 
strong social network, social support system. So I do not believe there's a fair bit of debate in the literature related to aging, that whether it's a disease. Yes, with certain, with aging, certain deficits do come, but it is a developmental process. As when we are young, we gain. As we get older, we lose. But aging is more than just a disease. There's another question. Could you give an example of a switch that doesn't get turned on due to epigenetics? Um, I will uh, try to give you an example. And uh, that is the Dutch famine is a, one of the examples that I can use here to explain what I meant by that. When the Dutch famine happened, many of the children who were born during that were malnutrition. If you go and look at the genetics, the genes, the genes look very normal. It was something to do with the environment that was sort of initiated by this uh, particular phenomenon of Dutch famine that actually turned on this, blocked the switch because sometimes in order for genes to work properly, you have to turn on the switch. Other times you have to turn it off. And it wouldn't allow, depending on what the gene was, to turn the switch on and off. And that would be one example that I can give you. It is like a light switch in your home. If you, have a, you come home and you have a teenager, for some reason they were chewing gum and they take the gum and stick it below the switch, switch looks fine but there is environmental debris underneath that switch that you can't turn the light on and off unless you remove uh, that uh, chewing gum from that switch. So that would be a one uh, relevant uh, example. Another one is the adverse child uh, experiences I talked about in my presentation. And there is some evidence that actually that particular environmental experience or social experience or abuse experience actually creates these epigenetic changes that have nothing to do with, with the genetics, genetic makeup of the person, but it causes certain chemical reactions that put people at, uh, at adverse outcomes. There's another question, is there a relationship between sight loss and cognitive losses? As I mentioned, there is some emer information emerging that the sensory losses, not only just the sight, but the hearing losses might be linked to cognitive def deficits. I think even though I presented some data related to that, there is a lot more research needs to be done to understand what that will link might be. And uh, yes, there is some emerging evidence. Is it uh, established? No, I think we need to do more work in that space. There's another question, are we gradually in North America increasing our lifespan? It seems that an active lifespan is key to enjoying our next few years. Have really enjoyed your presentations, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for that compliment. Uh, we have been, for many years, our life expectancies have been going up. Last year was one of the first times in Canada, actually, life expectancy went down and that was uh, uh, mostly due to opioid deaths that have happened in the country because a lot of younger people were dying. In, and I assume we will also see a decline in life expectancy for people over the age of 65 because of the pandemic uh, related deaths that have happened in a very short period of time. I think that the, we are, I, it is going up, but it is going up very slowly. And I think we will reach a plateau, but that determines, that depends on what our social innovation, our technology, and where our medicine goes in that space. And uh, so there is some interesting research to be done, which factors are gonna to continue to push the life expectancies towards upwards, or which are going to um, uh, make them go down. For example, the generations coming behind us, have very high rates of obesity. They are getting diabetes and some of the health problems a lot early. They might live very long because of the magic of the modern medicine and public health, but they might live in, in, uh, with chronic conditions for a long time. And what impact that has on their health, the aging trajectory. 
uh, remains to be determined. Um, question is, what do you think a loss of cognition relates to loss of hearing and vision? I don't think we understand that mechanism as yet, but obviously there is hearing and vision are centered in the brain as well. So there are some cognitive, sorry, the brain changes that are happening in relation to hearing loss or vision loss that brain is trying to compensate and how that compensation might be linked to changes in cognition is one speculation, but we really don't understand um, as to how that uh, phenomena is actually working. Um, there's a question from, have you looked at research from Netherlands where older and younger people are living uh, in the same institutions? Yes, we actually been developing a program here at McMaster. There is a not necessarily living together. I think there are cultural differences, what we will accept and what we won't. Um, but we actually, there is a new residence that is going to be built here at McMaster. And we working with the university, we are trying to create an intergenerational hub where students from the university and older people from the community can interact, maybe not live together from a day, day in day out, but able to look at this whole process of aging. And the question that was asked earlier on about the term aging and try to sort of think about dealing with ageism, intergenerational issues, and learn from different generations how we move forward. Looks like I have come to the end of my presentation. There are many more questions here, but unfortunately, I'm not going to have a chance to answer, but I can, if you send me an email, I'll be happy to answer some of those by, uh, via email. Thank you very much. Thanks, Perminder. That was an excellent, excellent presentation, and we really ap appreciate you taking time on a beautiful Saturday to stay inside and uh, let us inside the uh, workings of what's going on in the longitudinal aging study. Really fascinating and really like the way that you uh, brought in wisdom. So I think uh, I can speak for everybody with a big thank you from us to you for, uh, for doing that for us today. Well, thank you very much for having me here, and thanks to everyone who attended this afternoon as well.